Are we ready? Tell yeah. me when we're recording. Now. <laughs> Behind the screen, there's a world of pure imagination. There you go. Behind the screen. Uh, all right. There's a world Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Goble. Welcome me. to the Paul Goble Show. Man, uh, we have been waiting for so long to do this show. Here, I'm going to stop sharing that. Uh, all right. Joining me, as always, is my co host and best friend, Jim Bruce. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. And joining him is uh, his co host and best friend, Tom Griffin. Hi, everybody. Slightly resentful to be here. So, slightly, I mean, that's nice. Yeah, it's good to hear. It's a nice <laughs> it change great. from usual. Uh, uh, so, we wanted to have, do a show for so long, we were like, what is there to talk about? Why bother, right? All TV is going off the air. There's really nothing else going on. But this week, we found some stuff to talk about. So, we decided, to, why not? Let's get in into it and let's just, you know, let's just dish, right? Yeah, exactly. Let's just dish the, hey, what do you girls think kind of show, right? Let me bring this up. I don't even, honestly, I don't even remember what we were talking about before. What were we talking about before we started that I said we should talk about this during the show? It obviously was super important. Uh, I, we're, if I'm remembering correctly, you got really anti-Semitic with me and I was really <laughs> offended. Right, right, right. But I'm saying, what happened that doesn't normally happen? Oh, right, right, right. That's right. What were we talking about that doesn't normally happen? That was just our annual, that was our weekly. I remember what usually doesn't happen. Tom got really anti-Semitic. I forgot. Right, right. He joined in for a reason. I don't remember what we were talking about. Just trying out a new thing. And I I wasn't mad. I was like, oh, that's refreshing, just because of the way he did it. Because it seemed like, okay, that's fair, I said. Well, let me, let me, you just reminded me of something funny that I wanted to talk about you guys, talk to you guys about at the time. So this will be a fine conversation. I'm sure we've all watched The Mandalorian, or at least some of it. I've watched that whole damn thing. Okay, so we all saw the hilarious episode with Jason Sudeikis. No, I didn't see that one. Yes, you did. I didn't know. <laughs> and what's his name, where they were the stormtroopers, right? Adam was Pally. That? Adam Pally, right. Yeah. And fucking hilarious, of course, great episode. Did you see Pally on... Uh, Seth Meyers after he had done that no oh, okay so he said you know that time when he's supposed to hit Yoda mm, mm-hmm. well in the script it just says uh it, it just says something like you know stormtrooper jostles Yoda the the child so of course the first take Adam Pally fucking decks <laughs> Yoda in the bag because it's not even in the bag it's not even a puppet at that point right but unfortunately what he didn't know was uh, uh, at that time in production, everybody had grown really, really fond of Baby Yoda, obviously. Uh, and because it's not a real thing, any representation of Baby Yoda is, uh, uh, is you know, very coveted. So <laughs> they're, all the crew and everybody, they're all watching. Adam Pally does like, his, he decks it or whatever and goes, shut up. And the whole crew goes, oh, <laughs> and ruins the take. And John Favreau walks up to me and he's like, yeah. You got that, right? You know, right? You got what we're doing here? Okay, great. He's like, this is, but John Favreau basically tells him, this is the franchise, right? This is, this is it. Don't break it. And so he walks back and then <laughs> they get the shot, but everyone's super mad at Adam Pally now uh, because of course, baby Yoda has been there from the day one. Adam uh. Pally just fucking showed up. So then <laughs> Pally goes, well, in my defense, he just said something really anti-Semitic. <laughs> And nobody laughs, of course. They fucking hate it. And so he turns around to look at Sudeikis. And before he can even say anything, Sudeikis goes, oof. (laughs) (laughs) I just thought, man, that is the fucking perfect story. That's what happens when you invite comedians on your fucking Star Wars set. That's exactly what's going to happen. I just thought that was a fucking great story. Uh, That's tremendous. You know, it's funny, too, because back me up on this, Tom. If you uh, you ask me to watch a show, I probably ain't gonna do it. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he needs you to back him up on that. But uh, Mary Jo got me the Disney Plus as a gift for my my birthday. The original plan was to send me to Ireland. Something happened. I couldn't go. I was just trying to remember what it was. Like we had the money. Like we'd worked everything out. Got my passport. Something. I don't know. But maybe you were all you know, ready to go. It was a done deal. There huh? was something happened Did where you get I lost couldn't... on the way to the airport. 
That must be it. Yeah, because I, I turned around. I've just kind of been in my house chilling. Sweet. <laughs> so uh, she got oh. me Disney Plus, and uh, I I don't binge things in general other than say sorrow, and uh, I went ahead and binged that thing. It is good. And I it was is like, good. It was, I'm I'm delighted that. If there's one thing that's come out of this that's good is I saw the Mandalorian. <laughs> well, uh, I got it when it the, when Disney Plus opened, so I had to watch Mandalorian uh, in you know regular people time. I didn't get to binge it, but um, do you, do you have the, the all the Disney Plus, Tom? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I had so, it day one. Yeah. So let's talk about then. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what other shows we like on Disney Plus, if any. I mean, I watched obviously, you know. We all know you can watch every episode of The Simpsons and all the Marvel movies and uh, yeah. all the cartoons. But I made a point to watch uh, all the old Spider-Man cartoons, uh, not the super old ones from the 80s, but mm -hmm. the ones from the 90s with Drake Bell and the Ultimate Spider-Man and all those, mm -hmm. and which I, I really love. Which is funny, though, because if you watch the one with Drake Bell, which I think is just called The Amazing Spider-Man, I'm not sure, there's basically the last season is that whole movie into the Spider-Verse. The last season of that Spider-Man cartoon, you meet Spider-Ham and uh, Spider-Noir and all those characters. And obviously they just took that whole season and compacted it into one thing because it's yeah. all the same jokes, same characters, some of the same voices even. Uh, but I thought, uh, I, I definitely watched all of that. And, uh, and uh, I watched some old Disney movies. Um, but aside from shows, I think, the only original show I really was digging was Mandalorian. I watched all of that bunch of losers get together and pretend they're back in high school show it's as I sad watched, as it as yeah. it is funny i watched that jeff goldblum show a little bit oh you know me jeff, too i thought it was gonna be great but i hated it it's like at one point it's like jeff goldblum goes to a place where they make shoes and i'm like oh shoes oh so hmm, tell me hold on tell me about the yeah. shoe. oh what is this a pump oh. yeah we fucking get it shoes yeah and um and there's there's something about watching Jeff Goldblum talk about absolutely nothing and having no insight that doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> I don't know what no, it is. And I like Jeff true. Goldblum. Go ahead. I love, everybody loves Jeff if, Goldblum. If you want a good Jeff Goldblum show, and there aren't too many like Jeff Goldblum TV shows, but I would recommend if you can find, I don't know if it's available. Paul, do you know if Reigns is available anywhere? Oh, well, that was an NBC show. So chances are you might be able to find it at like, on their app nbc.com or maybe uh, on peacock when it launches yeah or um yeah I'm, I'm sure they definitely have it on peacock but even on i don't know i would just google it just to see i like that show is. quite a bit yeah um, it was based on an english show where the premise was uh the guy the cop reigns was basically nuts and he saw people and talked to ghosts he spoke to dead people, but they weren't really ghosts. They were all just figments yeah. of imagination. Yeah, he would have. He was. He was a homicide detective, and he would imagine the victims and have conversations with the victims, and that was part of his process. And what was but interesting he, about it was that he he wasn't psychic, right? He wasn't talking right. to an actual ghost. It was him him imagining the person. So the person it, actually it, only knew things that he knew. Right, and they and would have their, that conversation. The characterization of the dead person would change <laughs> over the course of the episode as he learned out more, learned more about them. Excuse me, but uh -huh. it was he wasn't doing it voluntarily. He was crazy. It wasn't like he he basically incorporated it into his process because he would often still talk to dead people. Like case in point, this is a spoiler for the first episode, but of course, you know, throughout the first episode, it's not until the end that you find out he talks to to imaginary people they save that to the end but also he's talking to his partner the whole time and of course you find out the end that his partner is dead and has been dead for years so he knew how his partner died it's not like that was a mystery he was trying to figure out he just has imaginary conversations with people who are dead and he's incorporated that into his uh, basically into his uh cop work and those people become his his uh his partners but yeah i think the best thing about the show was it, they weren't ghosts and they didn't have any information to give him. They would just yeah. kind of work things out with him, which was, uh, it was a, I found it to be a real acting challenge, but have you ever watched the, the English version with Stellan Skarsgård? He's, I have he's, it. No, it's not called Reigns. It's called something else, but he's the star of it. And it's very much like the first episode where him and his partner are driving around and, 
it's great because they they like leaving a crime scene or whatever. She's a woman. His partner's a woman, and oh. they get into the car and uh, they're driving around. And uh, then the, basically the beginning of the show starts, and a song comes on the radio, and she's singing it and having a good time while they get to the police station. And then of course when they get to the police station, she doesn't go in. She's not really there. Nobody sees her. It's all in his mind. Um, but uh, it, I don't know if it was English or if it was wherever the fuck Stellan Skarsgård is from, Iceland or wherever the shit. Hey, but speaking of which, I, this is such a side thing, but th- that's what it reminded me of. This dude I knew who was a comic used to have this joke, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ruin the joke if I make it funny. So I'm gonna try not to. <laughs> but he had this joke where he goes, he goes. Sometimes I hear voices in my head, but the voices have an accent. And he would always say it had an English accent, right? Yeah. And then my joke in the audience to uh, Brian, you guys remember Brian? I don't know how. Because <laughs> I would go like, apparently, the voices in his head can't do an English accent. Because that was the whole problem. Is he had this bit, and he goes, I, I hear voices, but they've got an English accent. I love Guy Wagner. And it was the worst, best thing. And then that guy one day, said the most racist thing in the world and didn't seem to know what it was. And I was like, I really like this open mic. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the great thing. Hey, about can, I, can I tell a quick story about Paul real quick? This happened to Paul this week and it is so funny. So <laughs> Paul Goble, uh, Tom, you may not know this, uh, likes to pick fights. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and uh, he fights with m- morons on Facebook all the time. And the nice thing about Facebook is there's an endless supply and he got into a, a, a kerfluffle, we'll say, with somebody. And he, he's making fun of the guy. And he says something, basically making fun of the guy for being dumb and a bad comic. And he goes, he said something to the effect of, yeah, well, I can't believe this is the first time you're bored. I, I, I would imagine you'd be bored with your own act. And he said, bored. And the guy goes, oh, real cool, making fun of me for being bald. And it was funny to me because I was like, wow, that is how much your hairline is a trigger for you. You saw the word, <laughs> he saw the word bored and I've misread things too, but I guarantee you that's not the first time he saw a word that was a little bit shaped like the word bored, you know? Also, also, if you go to that, if you look at that, you go to that guy, anything he has and look at his picture yeah you get it you understand why he got triggered because his hair is like this and his fucking he's got a 10 head and it's yeah it's obvious yeah. we won't say we won't say his name because that's not cool but i like the idea you call him up and you go hey you want to go uh bowling bowling is that even a word <laughs> making fun of a bald guy huh no i was if you how dare go, you go bowling with me that's probably when he's on stage and like he whenever he gets heckled no matter what he always he always says that it's like, so you guys, uh, you guys see that new uh, Robert De Niro movie? I hated yeah, that so. movie. You hate bald people? Fuck you! How dare you? Throws the mic down. It was pretty. That's funny. his whole heckling comebacks. I was he just was... assumes you said something about bald people and gets super offended. <laughs> no time. So how's everybody doing tonight? It's my birthday. I am bald, you cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is something I actually did want to bring up with you guys. Let me ask you this now, and this occurred to me. I don't remember what I was watching, but we all watch movies with like superheroes and science tech and things that don't exist. Uh, But in many of these movies uh, and TV shows that we watch, there are often (laughs) machines or people with powers that can always tell uh, like the truth if someone's lying or whatever, right? You know, I mean, especially in superhero movies, there's a gazillion characters whose power is just to be able to tell if someone's maybe not being 100% truthful, right? Whether it's fucking Deanna Troy or uh, The Vision or- Wonder Woman. Or who? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman has a rope, exactly. Or just some dipshit who, in a movie, who looks at a box and goes, yeah, He's on the level. You know, they, they just make shit up, right? To, t- to, to let us know people are, are telling the truth. So we buy a, that our whole story. Tim Roth TV series where that was like the whole premise. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, that one is different because at least they were explaining it with, with science. It wasn't, they, they didn't have superpowers. Science, but that's my point. I thought we just established that science tech doesn't exist. 
Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about science tech that does not exist. Like the ah. Back to the Future car is my point. Somebody okay. built that. That's science. But okay. So my point is, so why is it that still in these movies, and it's in every movie, but it's still in like superhero movies and sci-fi movies where somebody has the nerve to say, you've got to trust me. You just got to trust me with this. I feel it in my gut. And when they can go, well, Bob can actually tell when people are lying. So hold on, let me go get Bob. And then yeah. uh, I don't need to trust you. I can actually verify. We're, we're at the X mansion. There are like three telepaths here right now. Yeah. Right? Wolverine can smell when you're lying. Exactly. So, like, let me just see who's in the next room. <laughs> right? So you can just smell when you're lying. Um, That's what I don't understand. Yeah. Well, Tom and I have talked about this many, many times because, you know, we run out of things to say. He's usually pretty mad at me and doesn't want to hear other stuff. But uh, sometimes we'll be talking about oh, Star Trek and we'll talk about how, like, Star Trek's a good example of how you just kind of have to ignore how many problems would be solved with the transporter. And I think it's the same thing. It's like, well, yeah, we do have a lot of psychics and we do have all this tech, um, but... Also, if we did that, the movie's eight minutes because they go, ah, oh, no, that ain't true. We're done. I always thought yeah. that would be my idea, by the way, for a 007 movie. Uh, uh, is I have this idea for a James Bond movie where he's set up where he's got to go get the villain. And the villain is a high-tech villain. And he leaves the office of uh, Q. Is it Q's his name, right? M, M Money Q, Pen whatever one. Whatever. M, Money Penny. Uh, sure. And then whatever. And then uh, goes outside and I was like, oh, there he is. And he gets him. And the rest of them, and the rest of the movie is just him going, oh, man, I'm glad I got this good per diem. I'm just going to kind of enjoy myself. And he don't kill nobody. What was that guy doing out there? I know. It's just a coincidence. He was like hailing a cab. Did he not know that that was uh, MI6 headquarters? Man, I know he was not thinking, Paul. He, <laughs> he was, was not, not paying attention. No. Well, London's a small place because it's my understanding MI6 headquarters is right next to a really good restaurant. Yeah. So, by the way, I, when you get around to it, I watch the shows you asked me to watch. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I think I only said one show, so I kept my. I only remember one. Really, yeah. really low. Uh, what I asked you guys to watch was Space Force, so let's oh, talk I didn't about watch it. that. I didn't watch. Yeah, yeah, no, I watched it. I also watched uh, the season finale of Rick and Morty. So we can talk about that afterwards. Mm. I haven't watched it yet. You're stupid. So I prefer we don't actually, because <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Uh, um, so Space Force, if you don't know, is uh, a new show on Netflix created by Steve Carell and Greg Daniels. And Steve Carell is the star of it. And it has a, uh, a great cast and a lot of super funny people. And, Can I uh, tell you how dumb I am, by the way? By the way, this is how dumb I am. I saw who it was created by. I thought it was Steve Carell. And I was like, Steve Carell and a C-3PO guy? But I know that's not who he was. But for a second, oh. it went through my head. And I was like, uh, just a dumb guy. Wow, nice. That is reasonably dumb. Yeah, I know. that qualifies. I, re I caught myself, but okay, only good. because I thought, that can't be it. It must be R2-D2 now. But I just, <laughs> <laughs> it was such a dumb thing. So the premise is, like Trump announced, he the fifth, uh, or sixth or whatever branch of the armed forces and he said space force and now in this show it's when that's officially happened <clears throat> steve carell is the four-star general of the space force and uh, they're trying to literally uh colonize the moon with armies and people and that is their mission and uh it's of course absurd and there's a bunch of weirdos working there and that's the premise of the comedy of the show so Here's my, for my thoughts, because I watched that first episode twice, and I watched it a few times. And my first thought was, isn't this quaint? Isn't it funny when Trump used to say these stupid things and we all shook our head at his dumb Space Force ideas? How quaint. Um, but when are they going to do the episode where Trump is responsible for 100,000 dead Americans and cities on fire? Because yeah. I don't know that that's going to be so funny when they get to that. And I'm yeah. not trying to shit on the show, of course. Uh, aside from me, who could have predicted that this might happen. But my point is, is it hard for you guys to watch? It, I'll tell you something. Um, I, I was, it did strike me that had I been in the theaters when the little dictator was on the screen. <laughs> and 
saw that for the first time. Um, I was like, because I've always thought, of course, that's a brilliant movie, I've been told. So I watch it be, because, again, not necessarily I'm not, a, I'm kind of a dumb guy in some ways. So I don't necessarily see it as a great movie. I've just been told it's a great movie. So I'm like, <laughs> this is great. He's kicking that uh, balloon around that looks like the, the earth. Um, but I look at it and I, and then it made me think, well, I bet there was somebody in the audience at the silent theater who was like, boy, I wish this silent film actor could hear me because I don't find this all that funny right now. <laughs> and, and I, and I'm, I'm kind of with you in that, but. It, so wait, so you're saying because the guy was watching the silent movie, he, he also decided he would be silent and keep that to himself and not well, he, yell it out loud. He just knew that the guy on screen couldn't hear him. So he didn't. And he knew that because it was a silent movie. So when that guy went to see a talkie, he just had a full on conversations with everybody on the screen. Yeah. That's when they, that's when we found out dad was crazy and locked <laughs> him up. But, um, but my, my point is, my point is I, I get where you're coming from. And I, uh, I didn't enjoy the show in that regard because of the headspace I'm in. It's yeah. not the show's fault. Right. It's, it's what just, I'm saying. But I do think there was a moment by the way, where Steve Carell's character uh, is in a hurry and he says, no time. And I was like, Oh, like the office. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And now I, 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 you, you reminded me also, cause I want to, <coughs> I want to talk about his fucking voice. <coughs> Does that bother you guys? <coughs> Tom, what do you have to say about the show and his voice? Uh, well, his voice didn't bother me. I found myself, I had a, a moment where I was wondering like, can, how, is that hard on him? Can he keep that up? Like, well, that, my first thought is, is that his voice now? Because, I mean, he's much older than he was on The Office. His hair's gray. Why would his voice be a little scratchy? But as a as a, a bad old actor, I know that sometimes we put on affectations to uh, distance ourselves from other characters we played. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. Can he keep this up? I guess. I've watched five episodes and it's still going. Yeah. But it still bugs me a little bit. Yeah, I just, I, I found myself wondering, like, was that a smart choice? Like, at, right. can he speak at the end of the day? Like, like he was he, like, halfway through shooting the first episode going, oh, this was a mistake? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah he yells oh. a lot on the show for, for yeah, obvious and I, reasons. And it seems absolutely, Paul, to your point, not just how he happens to talk. That's for sure a choice. Yeah. Although I yeah, will say right. this, in the age of uh, COVID and quarantine, as a guy who's a frontline worker, <laughs> at the end of the day, a lot of times I have that voice because yeah. uh, I wear a mask all day long. And in my particular gig, I end up talking a lot and I deal with a lot of people who need to be comforted. So I'm tend to talk kind of loud because I'm also trying not to infect them because I've got, you know, wear the mask and stuff. Yeah. So, well, um, I want to, I do want to take this opportunity, Jim, to commend you for taking a job where you have to talk a lot. I know that's hard on you. Yeah. So I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. Um, what other thoughts do you have on the show, Tom, if any? I'm uh, sure you have some. So, yeah, I have a couple. One is, so I, I watched the whole thing. I enjoyed it. Um, I didn't love it. I enjoyed it. Um, I think it's a show you have to take, you have to go into the show and try to meet it on its own terms and ha it requires a healthy dose of suspension of disbelief because there's some things about it that just don't add up. Like yeah. they, they establish immediately that Steve Carell's character was a fighter pilot, but then he's also kind of a dummy that doesn't understand math and physics. And those and things aren't compatible. Right. Like, right. He's not a fan. Like of, we think we, we probably physics. think of fighter pilots as being real jockey, but those got, you need a solid background in math and physics to be a fighter pilot. If you ever hear fighter pilots like talk about engagements, the way they describe them is they describe them like physics equations. Like yeah. they talk right. about the conservation of, of energy and whatnot. That's, how, that's, that's why that's, many of them go on to be commercial pilots because that's the most important thing is to know what the fuck happens when things go wrong, like in flight. Yeah. When so you're like, so so that that was something that I struggled with a little watching it was that every time that Steve Carell like suddenly didn't understand how things worked I was like that doesn't track for me like, oh that's case in point in the first episode when they have that hilarious joke where all of a sudden he's Homer fucking Simpson and he puts his feet up on the console and accidentally launches a goddamn rocket yeah are you serious what are you Max Senate that was the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen in a sitcom it gets I, a little. It gets a little get smart in moments. 
Yeah. yeah. Ironically so, which, enough, which was another movie he fucking and, ruined. Uh, yeah. well, I, so, so that the other part of it, I think, is that there is, and this is these are related. I think that there's there's a tonal problem in that sometimes they go for broad farce and sometimes they go for real, like low key farce. And the low key farce, I think, is great. The when they're just having conversations and annoying each other. It's and, a and, very, and, it's a very funny show, especially because Malkovich is so fucking good. He's yeah. really funny because he's the opposite. He's dry and like that scene. Malkovich, yeah, he's that great. scene where they have to watch the video of him singing that song, and he and and the one woman points out, uh, "You were watching him for months before you fell in love with him." <laughs> yeah, and he goes, "I understand the optics are problematic." That right fucking there is genius. That's the perfect comedy. The character that is um, Steve Carell's uh, like secretary, Don Lake. Uh, I think the character's name was Brad. I want to say, yeah, like, very funny. That character is hilarious. And that's Don Lake. The guy's been doing improv yep. and comedy for fucking fifty years. He's a genius. So you know, and I think then, that's the key: is get is the people who are really good in their roles. They just get to be funny and be funny characters, but. Obviously, Steve Carell has all the heavy lifting because he has to be funny, but he also has to be believable and he has to be sympathetic and he has to give a bunch of fucking information. And maybe they hurried this show out a little too quickly because, uh, I don't know, some shit happened. Yeah, you know what? Honestly, too, now that you guys mention it, I, this never occurred to me before right now was just like, and this happens a lot in TV. We, our friend Susie was on our last episode and Avenue five is like the version of this show where they nailed it. <laughs> True. And Speaking Avenue of, five is the 30 rock and this show is the, Speaking uh, of, so, yeah. so yeah. Jessica, Jessica St. Clair is just in all the space shows now, right? Is that right? Apparently. And not appar and, and apparently she's been in the business for years, but just now someone realized she should be a, a romantic lead. Only just now right. that is this hilarious, beautiful woman a romantic lead. Where the fuck have you been, dummies? And she's and she's really good uh, for what it's worth. But we know that's going to take forever. That that storyline. The other thing about the show that's not good, that is not the show's fault, is when Fred Willard shows up. Right when you forgot that he's dead and you're sad, he yeah. fucking shows up in a scene and he's hilarious and it's his most bittersweet fucking thing ever. Mm. And yeah. again. It's not the show's fault, and the only way to get around that is to wait until people aren't sad again. But <laughs> uh, when's that going to fucking be? Here's what I did like about the show, and, uh, and I really mean this. First of all, hilarious diss on the Coast Guard. Who's with me on that? <laughs> yeah. Right? Screw those guys. <laughs> fucking hysterical. I'm and I thought, well, I guess that. OSA <laughs> is not the only people who ha hate the Coast Guard. <laughs> Yeah. But I like, but I really do think that's funny because even as much as they all think Space Force is stupid, it's still above the Coast Guard, which has been in existence for years and years. So that's a great fucking joke. I'm going to defend it forever. The other thing I like about it, and this is really what the key, and it's a Greg Daniels thing, obviously, because like The Office and like Parks and Rec, they set up a situation that is extremely dysfunctional in a lot of little ways. And yet, when it comes together, it all works. The office is a bunch of fucking dummies, but somehow they're the only one that stays in business because they all work to make the office work. Parks and Rec, that town is a fucking nightmare, but somehow not only the officials, but everyone in it works together so everybody has a nice life. And I think this is the same deal. Of everybody's pretty fucking dumb who works there, but because they're uh, unified, case in point in the second episode, which I kind of hated, uh, that fake monkey and all that stuff was uh, really annoying to me. But uh, case in point, he brings in the sign language guy to tell him what he wants to do and say, I need you to do this because here's our plan. And the sign language guy goes, well, that's never going to happen, but okay. Hi, monkey, blah, blah, blah. Like he doesn't even hesitate, even though he knows this will never work. And they get very close. <laughs> However, he was right. It did not fucking work. And I find that funny because it's like, well, everybody has their job. And regardless of what they think about this situation, they're all there to do their job. And in the meantime, I, th I think a lot of people too can, you can relate to the idea of someone above you telling you to do a thing that you know will not work, but you have to go through the motions 
because they won't they won't listen when you tell them it's not going to work. And because ultimately, if you were to have that conversation, it would end with them saying, "What's your job? Then do your job." Right. And they would ultimately tell you, "I don't care whether you think this will work or not. Just do it." So just skip to that part. We all know better. Every blue collar guy knows. Just skip to the part where they're wrong. Jim has a great story about uh, the fucking warehouse guy, right? When you used to work in that warehouse and your boss was a complete shit stain and he used to tell you to do all this stupid shit that you knew was wrong. Oh, yeah. Um, it's funny, though, because I blocked that out because, but <laughs> I'll tell you, I worked in a warehouse and I'll just skip to what I know to be true now. So I used to be a warehouse manager and the important thing you have to know is, number one, this was a plumbing company that did home repairs, and I'm not capable of doing plumbing or home repairs. And it was important that we do acquisitions of the right kind of materials, and I don't know what those are. And, uh, but it's about building relationships, and I can't do that. So it's fine. I had this job, and the guy who threatened me a couple of times. Uh, this is your boss? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And listen, to his credit, it's me. But uh, years later, uh, after I left the company, he uh, tried to have the other person who owns the company murdered. Yeah, I was going to say, didn't he eventually like oh. embezzle the money and try to have his partner killed? Yes, and like <laughs> most things at that company, it didn't quite work. Uh. Couldn't even get that done. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I think you're right. It's, uh, there's a thing because, because they do refer to Trump all the time. They don't call him Trump. They call him POTUS, obviously. But they refer to him all the time in the stupid shit he says and does and wants. And, uh, and ultimately, he's the boss. Because then, uh, I mean, what's the first line when they're making Corella four-star general? They say, you only answer to the sec def, which is Dan Bacchadal. He's speaking about himself. Mm -hmm. And the POTUS. And, uh, and so they make it clear, you're in charge. And it's almost like they leave him alone. Because we don't really get to know the other joint chiefs or whatever they're called. Except for Kick, who's obviously a dipshit. Right. Um, so it's almost like... Steve Carell is left at the top to kind of make sure things go wrong. But like you said, even he, or rather things don't go wrong, but like you said, even he doesn't know everything. And so sometimes he just has to make a guess and hope it turns out. Yeah. Which it seems to me is the point of the show, but I think that's kind of a weak message uh, if we're being honest, because it seems to me like at the end when he went, Oh, sometimes, you know, he had an umbrella and he was too scared. You can't always be scared. Okay. So what you're saying is sometimes you got to take a chance and hope it works out. Great fucking life philosophy, bro. I mean, that's a good way to live when you're 20, maybe. But uh, well, and it's funny. also a good way to live if no one's life is at stake. Yeah, well, that's that's true. Um, <laughs> there, there was a good scene with the um, with the um, Joint Chiefs that I liked, uh, where they, those characters are are set up as kind of, you know, kind of jockey and kind of bullies and kind of just making fun of everybody and making, you know, Poppies, Ooh, ah, we're going right. to bomb them all jokes and like, and, but then when things get serious and the, the, the president has apparently ordered them to commit a, a war crime, everybody in the room suddenly becomes adults and they're like, we can't do that. Right. Oh yeah. And, uh, and that's, it also happened with Don Lake, the character of Brad you're talking about who seems to be kind of a dummy, of course. He's like the bumbling assistant, you know, he doesn't really add. But then all of a sudden when the storyline about Melania Trump suggesting these god awful ridiculous outfits, apparently now all of a sudden he's on board, he's on the job and he's finessing her and trying to explain why these aren't a good idea. For some reason, he's good at that, but bad at everything else, right? Which, it's, see, yeah. It, and, and then also, and as much as I love fucking I was Ben seeing, Schwartz, See, I was saying I liked I liked that scene with the Joint Chiefs because I it it gives some nuance to the show where it's like they they were kind of dicks, but they were only really they really were joking around. Like when when, <laughs> well, the when shit, they threw all that shit at the Coast Guard guy and made him leave the room. I mean, that's dicky. But they're just <laughs> yeah. being a dick to a one dude. Like when 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 it came time for them to be professional soldiers, they were, and they were like, "We can't. You just ordered us to commit a war crime. We can't do that." Okay, so then, so I didn't get to this episode you're talking about, but I, I think it kind of, 
is disingenuous if you're going to have so many characters be so like again uh, i'll give you the example of where this worked the office episode where andy is trying to introduce all these incentives and jim tricks him into saying he'll get a tattoo if they make x amount of sales you remember that episode yes not very well well i do it's one of my favorites because it could really happen. I like it because I could see that happening and I could see me being the guy doing it. Uh, any, I could be any one of those people. I could be Andy, I could be Jim, I could be fucking Stanley. I could be any one of them. You but could be Stanley, you, you could, could be, Stanley. be Jim. <laughs> <laughs> no. so, but uh, the, the reason hey, it works Tom, is- Tom, Tom, tell yeah. me he thinks he can be Jim. <laughs> he thinks he can, he can be Jim. <laughs> Oh, see, this is what I mean about adapting to this new technology. Well right. done. But the point is... Everybody... Yeah, it's going to play great on the MP3. <laughs> when, uh, when, when, when Jim finally gets him to, to gets the plan in motion, it's not just, ha-ha, wouldn't that be funny? They all get together and do their job and, and work and make it work. So Andy does have to get a tattoo. And in the meantime, they've all done a good job. And, and, and I'm fine with that because they've already set that up, that for years, that's how this business has worked. But we all know, A, that's not how the government or any branch of the fucking military works. And B, this show's been on for a week, and I'm already supposed to believe and trust in these characters that they would do that. Well, Especially when Patrick Warburton in the first episode uh, makes it clear he doesn't understand how space works. Paul, it's funny. That this comes up so many damn times. I brought it up two episodes ago um, when Brian was here um, about how on TV shows that just start out and want to have credit that they haven't earned versus credits earned. Again, suddenly Susan, we're supposed to give a shit about a relationship and the scene depends on us believing something they haven't set up. It's, it's a problem sometimes with shows. Well, and, and also well, I think in this new version of shows, because as we've talked about many times, that now uh, shows get a, you know, whatever, a 20 episode order, they will run all 20 episodes no matter what. So you don't have to put everything in the first episode anymore. You don't, you're not making a pilot. So you, you fucking drag things out. Case in point, this Lisa Kudrow thing is, you know, we have no idea why she's in prison. They're going to drag that out super long. I did. Uh, like so we found so out watch, I like it, but so watching the first episode uh, is not a good, uh, a good indicator of how the show is. You have to watch a few. Sometimes you have to watch the whole fucking first season to, for it to all get good, um, which is fair. But I think that's the trap you fall into by, you know, when they like, it's, I'm going to call it the Westworld phenomenon. You're writing the show that is very deep and then eventually you're going to pay all this stuff off, right? So by the time you get to episode six, you think you're actually in season six and you're writing these big fucking reveals that you think are amazing when the truth is the audience has only been watching this show for three hours. Not, not three seasons, but three hours. I, even though you've been working on it for three months, I've just been, I'm only invested in three hours. So your big ass reveal is certainly not the red wedding. You need to fucking lower that bar. I guess that is that the problem. Are we all agreed on that? Yeah. Or the white wedding, right? That no, boy. I feel like I feel like we've wandered fairly far from from Space Force, but well, yes, we're so just I talking think, about TV shows, I guess now. So I think well, so I, I guess you haven't seen that episode, but that worked for me, and I think that was an example of the show being able to add some depth and play the farce against something real, like. Um, that was an episode. That was an episode for me where they were in command of their tone. I don't think they have been throughout the whole run. Um, yeah. Uh, well, and a, another point I wanted to bring up that seems quaint is uh, the funny, hilarious Russian guy who's clearly like over the top spying for Russia, mm -hmm. and Steve Carell just rolls his eyes because he's like, "Oh, we have to have him here uh, so he can spy on Russia." And again, that seems fucking quaint to me that that got for, for what i would say is why are you even bothering to spy aren't you in charge this whole fucking thing is a russian operation just come in and tell me what you want and take it back to your bosses why are you pretending because that that whole thing is fucking stupid and then with him dating the daughter we all know how that's gonna end up as just fucking it's just corny and manipulative all right uh do we want to move on to trivia 
All right. Well, you guys won't believe this, but somebody answered the trivia question from last week. What? Which means somebody listened to the show. That's the amazing part. I, yeah, that, that must have, how did that happen? Well, because we were streaming the show on my Twitch channel last time, uh, a couple people went to watch it because we had a TV star on the show and they wanted to see if we were lying, I guess. And so, <laughs> and so they like, tuned in like to watch as if, it. As if, if it would have been audio, audio only, we'd have like Brian pretend to be Susie. Is that Got a wig on? Uh, <laughs> oh, we should have had him do that when he came to the show. Ah, when he definitely showed up. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, Steve Bernard Jr. was uh, watching the show on Twitch and he asked me and he answered the question in the chat during the show. Oh. And, uh, and uh, uh, the question was, um, Susie did voiceover on a lot of cartoons and she worked on one with um, uh, Bruce Willis, that cartoon being Bruno the Kid. Basically, the show was where oh. Bruce Willis was a kid. Do you remember that? Uh, wow. I, yeah. Now that you said it, it like suddenly came back to me. But yeah, yeah I would Bruno not have, was his jazz guy. Would not have character called that. And, yeah. Hey, let, let's talk about this for a second then. Okay. Man, way too many cartoons where dummies play little kid versions of something. I don't well, like any one of them. That's like always them. happened. Li the remember Little Anderson? Rosie? Didn't you like Little Rosie? I would have liked the Little Roseanne. I would have liked Little Rosie if she was a little bit anti-Semitic and you were like, oh, this is going to really become something later. <laughs> That's what they should have done with Louis C.K., make a Little Louis cartoon. See how funny that is. <laughs> a Little Louis cartoon where he's like, I want to show you my ding ding. <laughs> and they're like, we're at work. I know we're kids, but we're at work. What the fuck? Listen, uh, if you, if you want to be a big shot on the playground, you have to watch my ding ding. Hey, they agreed. Mm. And that sounds so, like a good show. Yeah, it sounds great. So the answer was Bruno the Kid, and Steve Bernard Jr. got it right. And uh, I asked him if he wanted a prize, and he has yet to get back to me. <laughs> <laughs> he has yet to respond so congratulations steve bernard jr you uh you got that correct and you double got the prize. congratulations number one for getting the trivia and for knowing you have nothing to offer him yeah that's nice for just <laughs> it's like it. it's the ultimate no prize um all right so here's the question this week uh since we're talking about fred willard uh, i don't know if you guys remember but back in the old days uh when jay leno was on the tonight show the first time uh, I used to be in sketches on the Tonight Show, and then we there was one time when something happened, and I was no longer in sketches on the Tonight Show. But before that, I was in a few of them uh, because I knew one of the writers, and he would often call me in because they don't waste time with auditions on that show. If you know a writer, they just say, "Hey, you can you can stand there and be the guy for this joke." Uh, so one of the sketches I was in that was great was with Fred Willard. And uh, I look for, I look, I honestly look for footage of it all over the internet when he died. I could not find it. But the premise of the sketch was it was during the Dole Clinton election. You remember that when Clinton trounced fucking Bob Dole in uh, getting reelected. But the premise was Jay decides that uh, he, he, everyone is too stressed. And he runs into Fred Willard, who says, well, have you tried whistling? That always puts me in a good mood. So Fred and Jay walk around the neighborhood whistling, and everybody joins in. And the first people they meet are me with a Clinton in 96 shirt and another guy with a Dole in 96 shirt. And they walk up on us, and we're arguing, and they're whistling, and then we decide to whistle. And then they meet a mailman and a dog, and then they meet all these mortal enemies who decide to whistle, and that's the joke. I don't know how it ends because uh, I doubt that it did. Um, but obviously it was a great fucking it's experience. It's still going. It's still going. It was a great experience because it was before uh, Jay Leno uh, hated me. And it was uh, also, I was standing this close to fucking Fred Willard all day, which was awesome. And I got to watch him joke around with Jay. Um, so the question is, the writer in question who got me that gig and uh, subsequent gigs um, is a writer you guys have definitely heard of. He was one of the uh, semi-regulars on uh, Colin Quinn's show. What was that called again? Tough, Tough Talk crowd. or whatever? Tough Crowd. Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn. So he was a semi-regular on that show. He's a very popular stand-up comic. I know you guys have heard of him. If you're a fan of stand-up comedy, you may have heard of him. That's my question. Who was that comedian 
who was also a semi-regular on uh, Tough Crowd with Colin Quinn, who got me those gigs. And while you're thinking of your answer, I'll tell you, after that thing happened with Jay Leno where he made fun of my hair and I clapped back at him and then they cut the bit and I was never seen again, I, I liked to pretend that I might be back again and I was, I was trying to play it off like it wasn't that big a deal. And then I was at the improv a couple of weeks later and this comedian was there and he looks over and sees me and goes, <laughs> who the fuck talks back to Jay Leno on his own show? And uh, I knew I had fucked up. So uh, that was a pretty great night. So who do, you, who do we think that uh, comic was? Tom, do you have a guess? Was it stupid? Because <laughs> stupid was on the show a lot. And, no, because he had shut up by that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he wasn't on the show. No, it wasn't stupid. Anyone got a guess? Uh, Greg Giraldo? Oh, that's a good guess. But no, it was not Greg Giraldo. He was alive at the time. But yeah. that's a fine guess. Tom, do you have one? Uh, Nick yes. DiPaolo. Oh, that's also a good guess. But uh, no. Um, so that's not, neither of those are the answer. If you think you're, if you're listening to this and you think you know the answer, write to me somehow. Uh, like, actually, write to Steve Bernard Jr. Ask him how he got a hold of me. <laughs> and then use that same technique to send me the answer. You can you know, send it to me through Messenger on right. Facebook or... Or whatever there is. Uh, there's a million ways to fucking bother me. So I got, I got uh, a little side topic. Can I bring up a side topic? Yes, let's talk about this and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Go ahead. How, how does something that's clearly not correct become a good guess? So I've been thinking about this. Like, I guess wrong things all the time because I don't know a lot of stuff. And sometimes people go, oh, that's a pretty good guess. And then other times people go, ah, that's a dumbass guess. But they're always wrong. What well, makes a, a guess that's wrong good versus a guess that's wrong a bad guess? What is it? What's that intangible? You see what I'm asking? Well, well I there, think it's there, ultimately it's making an educated guess versus a wild guess. Right? Yeah, there are guesses that are in the, the neighborhood. Like Greg Giraldo and Nick DiPaolo were actually on Tough Crowd all the time, right? So right. conceivably that they qualify from everything I set up, yeah. Right. So, but you but wouldn't if, say if we said like Tom, because Rita Redner, like, Redner, like yeah. that wasn't going to be a good guess, right? I, I would think I would Rita Redner, you'd be like, boy, that's stretching. That's a pretty good guess because it could have been Rita Redner. Maybe she was working on the show at the time. But I did also yeah. say semi regular, which yeah, those two right. guys are, and she is not. So. That's the point. Is it a wild guess or is it? I think the problem is sometimes you think you're making an educated guess when you're wrong and it sounds like a wild guess. Like someone asks you a question and you go, I don't know, is that Scott Hamilton? And they go, bald gay skater? I don't think so. Well, I'm asking you a question about Star Wars. And of course, you thought you said Mark Hamill. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, no, yeah. But that's. Still a good guess, but a bad functioning brain. <laughs> yes, Mark Hamill is a good guess for a Star Wars question. That's my point. Scott, they don't, the people who are asking you the question don't know that you mean Mark Hamill. And well, so to if, you, you they, say, hey, I thought that was a good guess. But what they're if, like, no, dummy. What if they think, oh, Jim's got some inside information about how a lot of USA skaters were in the original Star Wars. I didn't know that. That is an amazing guess. Tom, were how many original U.S. American skaters were in the original Star Wars? Um, none. Okay, what? that's not a good guess then. So you're, you're saying right. Dorothy Hamill, not in Star Wars? Not as far as I know. And uh, Christy Yamaguchi, not, not in Star Wars. I don't believe so. Ty Babylonia, not in Star Wars. Pretty sure. Randy Gardner, not in Star Wars. Yeah, no. Well, story checks out, Jim. I don't know what to do. And, uh, did they ever? That was it. That was the list. <laughs> Did they, ever have a dinner? did they ever have a dinner? <laughs> I did a roast here. Uh, there's this cat cafe here in Phoenix. It's like, you know, they take in rescue cats and find homes for them. And you can go there and hang out and play with them. And so uh, sometimes they do comedy shows there. And at, even though I've quit comedy, I like to go there and do the shows because I get to hang out with the cats uh, in be you know, while I'm not on stage. And it's, it's awesome. Uh, and one day they were doing a roast there because this one of the cats has like no legs or I think he only has two legs and he's like the, the pet. He, they don't obviously he's they're not finding a home for him, but he was having a birthday or something. So they did a roast for this two legged cat. And I was like, oh, fuck, I got to get in on this. <laughs> and 
everybody had funny jokes, but I went like all old school. I basically said like, oh, Lucky's here. He's been here at so many great events. Like, in fact, Lucky was in the car with Kennedy and he said, put the top down. It's a beautiful night. <laughs> all my jokes were like that. <laughs> in fact, Lucky was at the duel with Hamilton and Burr and he told Hamilton, just shoot into the ground. No one will remember this. Hey, <laughs> all these fucking great old school jokes. And then because the cat only had two legs, I said, I'd like to close with a song. She's got legs. Barely. Good night, everybody. <laughs> That's pretty funny. It was good I, times. I love I had, shows like that. I was talking about rescue cats today, and this was an observation that I found. Wait, isn't that that sketch you guys used to do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was the observation I made. That and was I a joke it. for nobody. Yep. I, I finally elucidated for myself what I've been trying to tell people. Sometimes there'll be a rescue event. Now, what you were doing was a good thing because you were helping raise money for the kitties. I That's guess. great. But I do not like to go just visit rescue kitties unless I'm getting a kitty because it sure. makes me sad. And I finally realized why. I was explaining it to someone because I go, oh, they're cute. And then I said, I said, yeah, but. Let's say I said, hey, let's you and I go to the orphanage. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you kids. Yeah, look at that. Bobby, you don't have a home, huh? Ah, oh, you're a cute kid, though. Later on, sucker. <laughs> That's what it feels like to no, me. I get it. But aren't you also assuming a lot in that you would be qualified to adopt even a cat? I mean, <laughs> come on. Are people going to let you just fucking take a cat home at this point? I think they're more likely in our country to give me a kid. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Especially if it's a brown one. Get him a fucking out of here. Um, ah, politics, man. All right. Uh, well, that's a good about an hour long show where we've tried to talk about things and no one showed up to ruin it. So I'm going to call this a success. Hey, uh, um, just real quick. Did anybody, has anybody seen the um, interactive Kimmy Schmidt special? Yeah, I fucking loved it. I yeah, watched, it's pretty good, I, right? I watched as many uh, endings as I could. And some of the some of the choices, if you select them more than once, you get like different versions. Yeah, I'm gonna go back when uh, when I've forgotten about it. My favorite one, my favorite ending is where uh, Jacqueline's daughter marries the prince, <laughs> marries Harry <laughs> Potter, and they're doing they're talking to the camera, and the, and the prince says something like, "And she didn't even know I was royalty," and she just like looks yeah, at you the see camera, her, like yeah. don't say anything. <laughs> That's very funny to me. But I also like the fucking theme song thing. If you haven't watched it, just Click on it and try to skip the theme song because that's pretty fucking great. Just that alone. Um, also, did, did you guys watch Scoob? I watched no. it. No. I did. It's not very good. I mean, obviously, it's for kids. But if I had kids, I'd buy it because it's one of those movies kids will watch a million fucking times. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of a million Hanna-Barbera Easter egg jokes. There's a scene where they go to an arcade and every video game is based on an old cartoon. So yeah, well, plus Dick Dastardly is in it and other characters. Yeah, if you had kids that, you know, <laughs> that's so funny. You know what I mean, <laughs> dummy. <laughs> Speaking of that, my fucking kids are awesome, uh, regardless of what they think of me. Uh, the second one. They're awesome just, because of what they think of you. <laughs> finished her second year at NAU and she's fucking killing it. And her sister uh, is a teacher at a private school where uh, a lot of the uh, – a lot of the parents are first responders and nurses and wow. people who are working on the front lines. So even though she's like working every other week, she's still teaching their kids and uh, keeping them all safe from the COVID and everything else. So uh, that's why my kids are great. Um, all right. Um, do you want to uh, give us a, a, a mashup, Jim, and we'll send it home? I will give you a mashup. Thank you. My desires are secondary to this issue. <laughs> oh, I see. But uh, I feel... You know, just as your your kid is helping serve the community, and I feel like this is what I do for the community. Um, so the mashups, you mean? <laughs> yep. <That's it. laughs> sure. We all thank you for your service. You're, you're <coughs> more welcome. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. So I I want I would love to play that. God, my accents are great. All right. Uh, is this English? <laughs> yes uh man I, let me do my bit about the voice i hear uh, uh, okay so i we will play the chess game why are you running away from me i'm a master chess player oh my hands are going through the chess pieces but i am very nice 
I am very nice and I am a chess master. Don't be afraid. I want to be your friend. Oh, I got it. <laughs> I want to be your friend. Don't run away. I'm great at this game. Also, no, I'm not Triumph. <laughs> and you're not mean like Triumph. Oh, right. do, you, do you know it, Tom? Uh, go ahead. It's Gary Kasparov, the friendly ghost. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Get it? Now, listen, I want to go back to what I was saying. So what makes a guess good but wrong, but what makes a mashup terrible but funny? Because sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> Scientists have been trying to figure that out for yeah, years, it's, Jim. It's why, and when look, they do, you're going to be out I, of business. I think it's, it's the level of audible... Uh, exhaustion you get from Paul and I <laughs> like yeah, that one I like so it's a failure that's when yeah. it's funny it's because wild. I like this one it's a complete failure well I, it's wild to me because sometimes I'll do one that I've labored over labor's a strong word but listen <laughs> sometimes I'll do one and I'll think ah this joke here and at the end of it I'm like wow I don't think those guys are my friends anymore. <laughs> yeah, you thought Pontius Pilot pitch was going to be dynamite, didn't you? <laughs> of course. Oh, I hated of it. Of course. And then there'll be other times when I'm like, you know, like I'll be doing a Star Trek and I'll, and the best I could think of was Fart McCoy. And <laughs> Paul will go, uh, Jim, I don't say this often, but you are a <laughs> You are a genius. I love you. And and you are America's greatest treasure. And I'll think, I don't fucking know what happened. Well, I got to see Fart McCoy now. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's not going to get any better than that. Uh, Sadly, thanks for joining us. So. <laughs> thanks for joining us, everybody. Tom, thank you. Jim, as always, thank you for working uh, at the grocery store and at the front lines and, and helping and can out. Can I just say really quick? really quick uh -huh. i mean this from the bottom of my heart if you go shopping at a grocery store do not talk to the cashier about politics do not talk to the cashier about how sad things are you have a right to whatever your opinion is after eight to ten hours of knowing that you are exposed to a virus and you may be going home to an elderly person at home and you do this whole song and dance where you take your clothes off a little bit outside, you go into a back room, you get showered. Those folks, if you really think that they're kind of heroes right now, what you can do to thank them is just be quiet or just let them be do nice. their fucking job. Maybe do what we're doing right now. When you're thinking about talking about politics, say to them, hey, you ever see Ren and Stimpy? Do that. <laughs> Just cut those people a break. And if you see me and you have to say, do say it to me, but I happen to be in charge of some of the most beautiful people. And um, I'm deeply grateful that I get to do that right now. And uh, I love them with all my heart. And so does everybody else who get, has to work these fucking jobs. So be nice. All right. That is good advice. And uh, I appreciate uh, you saying that. And um, I guess aside from that, we're, uh, we'll all go fuck ourselves, right? <laughs> Damn right. But about time. Ah, oh, this is about time. All right. Thanks, everybody.